Remember, um, fidget spinners were a thing, right? A couple years ago. So one day while I was procrastinating homework, I was spinning my fidget spinner, and then I had an epiphany. Well, what if I replace the weights of my fidget spinner with magnets, and then put copper coils on the outsides, and then spun the magnets with the fidget spinner and the copper coils, could I get the fidget spinner to spin perpetually, you know, without stopping continuously forever? So I wanted to know if that would work. Now, here's the principles of how that would work. On the our left, we have a magnet. The center is a, a wire with uh, the electrons inside of it. On the right is a copper coil. So the electrons, they hate moving magnetic fields. So anytime we have a magnet moving close to a copper wire, the electrons, they have to get away. They start to freak out. So as we move the magnet close to it, the electrons have to go somewhere, they freak out, and that um, copper wire, when it's connected to, uh, or when it's in a copper coil, um, creates a magnetic field. That's how you have electromagnets. Um, but what happens when we have a magnet uh, stop right next to the, the wire? Well, the electrons stop. They get comfortable. Okay, this is all right. But when we start to move the, cup, the magnet away from the copper wire, the electrons again start to freak out and they've got to move. So then we have um, another magnetic field. But this time we have the magnetic field reversed. So I had my fidget spinner. I decided to uh, take out the weights and replace them with magnets. And so I started designing. Um, first, I had some initial drawings where I kind of drew out what I thought would work, what I wanted it to work. Um, so I had my fidget spinner, the coils, and um, just kind of in the different positions, I thought, you know, what's really going to happen to the uh, electrons and the magnetic field as it goes through. And I, I kind of initially thought that this was going to work. So I kept going. I started calculating the magnetic flux and how much magnetic field does it take to get through um, the copper coils and can the copper coils really sustain an electrical pulse. Um, and as I went through the calculations, I thought, yeah, this might be all right. So I started gathering supplies. I figured out what type of um, magnets I wanted. These, these magnets are 19-pound magnets. So hold on, 19 pounds against a steel wall. I'm crazy strong. And then um, I just had a normal fidget spinner. I had to wind my own copper coils. So I've got a sewing bobbin that I just filled with uh, um, copper wire. And so this was the first prototype. At the end of the semester, um, me and my lab partner Justin Wilson created this rough prototype um, for our dynamics class. Um, so this one didn't work. It didn't do exactly what we wanted to do, uh, but we learned a lot in the process. A few of the things that we learned um, was the coil location. This was really interesting to me. As we spun it and gathered the data, uh, we had the position of the fidget spinner, and then we had the position, well, the electrons, the electro um, current going through the coils. And from that, we're, I was able to determine what was really happening to the coils at the precise timing that the magnet passed through it and the between, between magnets, right? And so I realized that I was wrong in my initial thoughts, but I was half right. So another thing that I learned was that the, the, the bearing, when I first put the bearing in, the magnets had it a, when I put the magnets in, um, the bearing slowed down because the magnets had um, induced the, the bearing and caused a lot of friction. Now, the other thing is the coils need to be moved to opposite the what I thought, as well as the diameter of the magnet and the distance between the magnets needed to be equal to create a perfect sinusoidal wave, um, perfect AC current. So after the semester was over, we presented our project. Uh, I started a new design. Uh, I moved the, ma the uh, bearings on the outside of the magnetic field and then kind of put the, ma the fidget spinner on a bar so it could rotate around. I kept thinking about the design and came up with this kind of final design. I wanted to add some pulleys and some other things for future reference. And so I, I kind of came up with that design. The next thing I had drew out the uh, fidget spinner is some kind of disc on the rod and how the, the bearings would fit together. And then I knew I needed some type of um, system that would hold the coils in the right position, but I also wanted the um, freedom to be able to move those coils where I wanted to, position them to where I wanted to as well. So I drew it in SolidWorks and had to do some redesignings as well, 
and I uh, came up with this. Um, I had some wood from my uncle, and uh, I asked a machinist if he would be able to machine these parts out of aluminum on a CNC. So I went ahead, and thanks to Hoven Calera um, using his um, mill in the lab, I milled out the wood base that I wanted, uh, and you can see those here. It was always fun to get a chance to run the machines. And, um, well, my machinist never got back to me, so a month and a half later, I broke down and bought a 3D printer and had to 3D print my own parts. A uh, good thing was I was able to prototype with it things that didn't work, um, and I came up with this final design. The next piece of it was using a, an Arduino to kind of figure out what, is el what else is going on. Um, I needed to find the rotations per second so I, I built my own photo gate, bought an LED and a photo gate transistor. So when the light hits the photo gate, the transistor, um, it can now count between when the light is on and off as it spins. So I was able to um, build uh, the, uh, the photo gate, the rotations per second. And here's just a little video of, of that working. So you can see it here, it starts at about 10 rotations a second and it slowly goes down to about four at the end of the video. So I was pretty proud of that. It took a little bit to uh, calculate or to uh, get that code to work out. And then because I had a lot of time uh, wasted with the uh, machinists not getting those parts, um, the last thing I was able to do before the symposium was uh, set up my coils um, and how they work. So I'm just representing how uh, the coils work in this video. Now I've added about five volts to the coils and if you time it right you can get the a maximum pulse on it and push the spinner forward. Now the future, future goal of this the, um, was to start a fidget spinner. I'm going to add a, a spring system to it so I can get an initial um, rotations per second that's calculated using um, the photo gate to determine the moment of inertia where you can set that up. What I want to do is use that motion of the fidget spinner, the rotations, to go into a gearbox that will transmit you know, one rotation to say 100 rotations. That will transmit to an electrical motor, a generator, that will um, power the Arduino or some kind of timing circuit. You, know, you can add capacitors and different resistors to a, to a timing thing that will turn on and off. And then time that to pulse the coils at the right time so the spinner is propelled forward continuously. At least that's the idea. Now there's one question that I have is, can you get enough electrical motor, electrical generation from the motor to have an electrical output? Well. Um, perpetual motion, perpetual energy is impossible in and of itself. It breaks a law of thermodynamics called the law of conservation of energy. It states that energy cannot be created or destroyed in an isolated system. So it's kind of impossible, and I know that, but it's still fun to build, it's still fun to learn. And I just have a special thanks for Dr. Sh Dr. Uh, Shirkel, Justin Wilstead, Hoven Calerda, Lee Brenton, and James Corman. Um, I'm fascinated in electrical generation, and I wonder, could you make an electric generator using this kind of system? So instead of having your camper that you need to put gasoline into your motor to have your camper working while you're outside, can you, could you do this? Could you have this replace a motor, right? I don't know. Yeah, you would you know have to have a pull system to pull it, get it to your initial initial velocity, and then it would run on itself. Kind of the idea is that perpetual motion. A, you know, a motor is not perpetual motion, right? Your car motor is not perpetual, but it's the same time you have a battery. It starts your starter, it starts the motor, and now you're charging the battery. So, yeah, you know, more ways around it, I guess. So aluminum is non-ferrous metal. It doesn't, um, magnets aren't influenced by it. That or brass. If you were to do steel, then yeah, I would have a problem with it. I wanted aluminum because um, my uh, 3D printer parts uh, flex, 
And so I'm not getting perfect motion out of it as well as um, these as well flex a little bit. So it'd be more rigid. Yeah, I learned that, um, well, I already knew that every time that the magnet passes the coils, the coils are impeding the magnet. So the, mag the magnet is going towards the coils, but the coils are pushing back. So that's the problem with perpetual motion is that um, there's energy going in, kind of stopping itself. So as soon as I connect these uh, coils, now that the coils are connected, it's slowing down a lot faster, right? So you have to come overcome that energy, as well as the energy in the transfer box, um, or in the, the gearbox, it would have to overcome the energy of the gearbox and the electrical circuit. The electrical circuit's gonna take energy, so it has to c overcome that electrical energy needed to power all of those systems. So the conservation of energy says you can't have more energy than what you started with. So, yeah. I kind of knew all those things, but I was just negating them. That's kind of fun. Yep.